Welcome everybody to another edition of the NNC, NNCI monthly webinar series. Uh, my name is David Gottfried. I'm the Deputy Director of the NNCI Coordinating Office. Um, this month's webinar is focused on the topic of societal and ethical implications of nanotechnology. And uh, in a moment, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jamie Wetmore, to introduce our, our panelists. Uh, before I do that, let me just uh, uh, mention uh, the August webinar, which will be held on August 25th, also at 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And that this will be in the education and outreach uh, portion of NNCI. And the speaker will be uh, Jared Ashcroft, who is the director of the Micro Nanotechnology Education Center and a professor at Pasadena uh, Community College, I believe. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to my to Jamie Wetmore from Arizona State University to uh, introduce the panel. Uh, thanks, David. Appreciate it. Uh, I am. We were asked to do an SEI, a societal and ethical implications panel for the seminar series. And I thought, you know what, let's just go old school. Let's bring in the big guns. Let's look back at all the crazy things that have happened over the last 20 years. Um, for those of you that are just sort of being introduced to SEI as a concept, um, people have actually been doing this work on nano for quite a long time. Actually, I think 20 years is, I think it's close. It might be 18 years, but that doesn't sound fun. So I just went with 20 years for the title. Um, but we have two people today. We're going to do sort of a panel discussion with uh, David Barubi and Andrew Maynard, um, two people that were there basically from the beginning, I believe, and may even be able to tell us how this whole thing started back then. Um, so our first speaker is uh, David Barubi, who is Professor of Science and Technology Communication at North Carolina State University. And he's currently, uh, amongst his many current titles, one of them is Director of Assessment and SCI at the Research Triangle Nanotechnology Network, one of the, um, one of the uh, nodes of the NNCI. Um, and our other panelist is Andrew Maynard, who, again, amongst many other titles, is currently Associate Dean of Curricula and Student Success in the newly created College of Global Futures at ASU. And I don't know that Andrew, he actually, Andrew might have an official title with the word nano somewhere in there, but he certainly does a significant amount of work on emerging technologies, including nano and books and online videos and uh, podcasts and blogs. So um, there's plenty of ways to find out what he's up to. But um, we will, I've got a number of questions. If um, attendees want to throw in some questions, please feel free and I'll try to pass those on as they come up. Um, but I thought we'd start with sort of a uh, question to get to know our panelists a little bit better, which is basically, how did you first get involved in nano and society? So David, would you like to start? Um, okay, uh, I was teaching at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. One of my students came to my office and said, uh, should I be reading this book? <laughs> and I said, I don't know, let me see it. And it was Engines of Creation by Eric Drexler. And I said, well, never read it, let me read it. And so uh, it was an easy read. So I made it through the book rel relatively quickly and um, uh, pretty much set it aside. Except uh, in the intercollegiate debate world, they were debating advanced technology. So we sort of snuck in this nano debate thing going on. And so that was kind of entertaining. What then happened is I went to the University of, uh, well, between that Trinity and, and the University of South Carolina where I really got involved, I did a stint at the University of Vermont. But when I got to the University of South Carolina, there was actually a group of people there who were um, uh, philosophy of science people and historians of science mostly. And they uh, were interested in trying to get a societal or a social science related grant from the National Science Foundation. Uh, South Carolina, we had our own jet for some reason. And so uh, we could easily get up to New, uh, to, to New York or to Washington on weekends or during the week if we needed to. And so we flew out and uh, visited the NSF, sat around, talked to a bunch of people, hung around there for a few days. There wasn't really any money for the type of stuff we wanted to do, but they fashioned together the first sort of exploratory nanotechnology inter disciplinary research grant. And so it was a uh, hundred and some off thousand dollars. We put a group together, we started doing research. And uh, before I knew it, somebody at Rice University lassoed me into playing 
with a, a bunch of folks at the International Council on Nanotechnology is where I met Andrew. So I'll let Andrew go next. And and what what, what years are we talking here, David? Oh, I'd have to check my Vita to give you the correct year, which I can. If you want Andrew are we to... Talking... Actually, well, no, I was actually going to ask you what year you read Drexler's Engines of Creation. So, I mean, that, that came out in the late 1980s, but I'm guessing yeah, you're he, looking at late 90s. You... No, no, no. It was around. Yeah, I can. <laughs> Relatively easy. I'm pretty good. Engines of Creation, 86, maybe. Yeah, 86, 87. Um, yeah. Which well, I, probably, I, I read it right when it came out. Oh wow, right, yeah. So, so you were there before me, and I. The, the reason I asked is it, it's fascinating, sort of seeing how long the lag is between sort of those early ideas and then when things began to crystallize around the, the social and ethical implications. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess I got various points. I actually started getting involved with this, but from the science perspective, back in the late 1980s when I started my PhD. So, my PhD was actually on analyzing what we then called ultrafine particles. Um, and I was told when I defended my dissertation in 1992 that it was a great piece of work that absolutely nobody would be interested in because there was not the slightest bit of interest in nanometer-sized particles. Um, so I basically abandoned that uh, for several years. And then sort of towards the, the end of the 1990s, I was working in occupational health. So that's the, my, my initial loose connection to society. Um, working in occupational health, and um, there was growing interest around really small particles and small particle inhalation. Um, so I sort of dug up my old notes using electron microscopy and, and analyzing ultrafine particles and got increasingly interested in nanoscale particles. And I was actually digging through my stuff. So one of the first reports we came out with, this is with the um, health and safety executive in the UK. I don't think they've ever published this. came out in 1990, uh, 1999. It was an analysis of the, the research and knowledge landscape around exposure to ultrafine particles. So that was one of my first forays into the field. Um, but broadening out into societal implications really didn't occur until I joined the, um, joined NIOSH in the, the United States and got involved with the National Nanotechnology Initiative. So the, the big step for me, it's actually, it precedes uh, David's involvement in ICON just a little bit. Um, but I was working at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. I came over to the United States specifically to do research on um, human health impacts of engineered nanomaterials um, and to develop initiatives at, at NIOSH. And it was around about the same time that a um, group of um, government agencies under the National Nanotechnology Initiative and really spearheaded by Mike Rocco and others were beginning to look at how we navigate the potential risks of these. And I was at, I think it was the first interagency meeting where we all got together around the table and asked, what on earth are we gonna do about that, this? Um, and actually looking back really cynically, I came away from that meeting thinking, this is an opportunity for our agency to get a bucket load of money out of it. Um, Hopefully, I've matured since then, and I've really began to focus on what happens in society and what's societally important rather than what's just important for the agency. But that was my in to a whole world of emerging technologies and societal implications. Um, and then, of course, a couple of years later, I, I got involved with the folks at, at Rice University, especially Vicky Colvin and Kristen Kolonowski, who introduced me to a wealth of talent, including David Berube, as we began to work out how we actually make this technology work for society. And Jamie, for your records, it was called the Nanoscale Interdisciplinary Research Team to support a Center for the Philosophy and Ethics of Complexity and Scale, uh, and to fund initial research in risk perception and risk assessment, funded at 175K, December 15, 2001. Wow. And, and that, that was an NSF grant? Yep, that was the first grant that was given. And I think that's where SEIN first appears. It appears in some discussions there, and then it appeared later when I have drafting the nano hype book. Yeah, it's interesting. SEI is kind of a fun acronym and societal and ethical implications. And uh, I don't think it's, I haven't found any use of it anywhere other than those of us that use it in nanotechnology. No, it, it is really interesting. So I, I, since then, I, I think like both of you, I've really worked across many, many different fields looking at the societal implications of emerging tech. And I, 
not only have I not seen that used elsewhere, but actually I haven't seen that much migrate from what we've learned around nanotechnology into other areas, <laughs> which is a little frustrating. All right, so we've heard about your both of your first sort of forays into nano and society, but it's also clear that the US government and funding agencies all of a sudden decided perhaps this was something that we should get on board with and move forward with. So curious if either of you can sort of explain to our uh, attendees what that process was like and how all of a sudden did money and interest become available from US government for this work? And if people want to reflect beyond the United States, I'm happy for that to happen as well. Do you want to get first, David, or shall I jump in? Are you are you starting with Neil? Um, we could go back there. Yeah. So uh, I, quite a bit we'll of this is Neil Lane. Yeah. So quite a bit, bit of this is <laughs> a, a, apocryphal. And um, so I I tell a, a very tongue in cheek story about in the 1990s um, when the, the National Institutes of Health were getting a bucket load of additional funding under Clinton. The National Science Foundation was really struggling to find something that they could justify getting equal hikes in funding with. Um, and I, I'm sure this story is wrong on many points, and I'm sure there are people on the call that will correct me on this. But, but one of the apocryphal stories is that folks at NSF were sitting around and um, somebody suggested doing something around nanotechnology and pitching this as a transformative uh, foundational technology that not only is going to change everything in the world, but it's something that the National Science Foundation can take the lead on. And they were smart enough to say, we think we can sell this, but we're going to have to get support from other agencies. So that was the beginning of conversations across multiple agencies with a twofold aim. One, I, there was a serious aim here, I think, to really push forward science and technology in the States in a fundamental way, in a transformative way. Um, but also there was this idea of raising the profile and raising funding for the National Science Foundation and for, for basic research here. So that that's the, the the story that I've grown up with here. And of course, that, that caught the idea, that caught the ear of influential people, including Neil Lane, who is the uh, both director of the NSF and then he was um, Bill Clinton's science advisor, and it really caught the ear of Bill Clinton, and then history was made. Well, the, my, my story is very consistent with that. It had to do with uh, getting off an airplane with President Clinton, I believe, in uh, 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 at Fort Wayne. So Airport. you just had to one up me. I, I have the approach. No, 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 no. You, it's you were actually on the data. plane. It's just a little more data. And, um, and, and uh, like Neil, Neil said, he always kept bunch of, of ideas in his uh, coat pocket. So, you know, you know, if, if, if there was going to be any sort of discussion about subjects, he would pull out his little notes and look through it all. And so something had, something had happened and um, Clinton had turned to him and asked for uh, uh, some way to improve his speech. And Neil said he reached into his pocket and he pulled out this piece of paper and he opened it up and it was his briefing on nano. And so it was a little bit like, you know, what if he had grabbed a different piece of paper, you know, in my <laughs> mind, you know, it happened to be in his pocket. So that makes it a little bit entertaining. But I mean, it's not like it wasn't discussed before, right? They had, they had thought about this and discussed it before, but that was the little, little Lincoln. And then, of course, Neil, more than anything else, was responsible for me getting involved with the icon crowd with Christine Kulodowski oh, and, and Vicki Colvin. Because I sort of got involved with you guys via him when I was chatting with him about, uh, I said, you know, I need to write this book about the history, how this all started. Because yeah. I said, if I don't write something about how it all started, it'll just disappear into the. Yeah. And of course, so, the really, the, the really interesting thing is that we didn't start from ground zero with nano. So the, the, the concept was new, that the brand of nanotechnology was new. But it really built on around about 100 years of, of research into material science. So the, the time was right to take all these different strands yeah. of research and bring them under the same umbrella. Well, the Richard Smalley connection at Rice all integrated all of this together. Of course, right? yes, yes. That's, that's what happened. I mean, he was, the, he was the, the king of Rice University at this period of time, pretty much, you know. And so what ended up happening is he was highly influential in how uh, the engineering program and even the folks in some of the uh, – Sciences associated with the engineering program would uh, be able to uh, direct their uh, research agenda, and it did impact a whole bunch of people there. So it led to this this international council. 
But the, so, thing that's really, the thing I think that's really interesting is um, uh, the, the, the societal component of this whole thing, you know, came together because of, I think, what Kristen and Vicky did, which was bringing so many people together in ICON from so many different disciplines. Which yeah, probably, I was a real early exercise in convergence. I absolutely agree. And of course, I had that grow out of the Center for was it, Biological and Environmental Nanotechnology, DBEN. Yes. Um, but, but yes, it was, it was when we sort of transitioned from the academic work to bringing this, these multiple stakeholders together that I think things really sparked off. And in fact, actually, even if you look at our work through the Woodrow Wilson Center at their project on emerging nanotechnologies, we built very, very heavily on the networks that ICON had put together, bringing in not only industry and academics, um, but the leading NGOs in the field, um, leading journalists in the field. It really was quite a remarkable effort there. And I was, I was going to say, going back to, to Rick Smalley, um, I also going back to origin stories, it was really an experience with Rick that, um, that sparked our work at NIOSH before I, I joined the Wilson Center. So we did very early work on exposure to carbon nanotubes, and we went down to Rick's lab and worked with him a couple of times. First time we went down there, uh, the guy was like a kid in a candy store. He took us into this lab, and he brought out this great big multiple gallon yellow bucket of single wall carbon nanotubes. And he said, watch this. He said he shook it, and his, his eyes just lit up. His whole face lit up as this cloud of black stuff literally filled the lab. So wow. there was Rick saying, look at this, look at this, look at this, this is amazing. And here was me and my colleague coming from an occupational health background, covering our mouths saying, don't, don't, stop it. Right. Um, but the amazing thing was, I we had a conversation after that, and the next time we visited, about six months later, the lab was pristine. Um, the, the transformation in terms of the realization that just because it's carbon doesn't mean it's safe was almost immediate. Um, and that was ad that was one of the most memorable points um, in my early research career into trying to understand some of these issues. I didn't have that 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 experience with uh, with Richard. The only experience I had with Richard is he pulled me aside when he says, "Don't waste your time on all of this stuff. It's all about energy. <laughs> right. It's all about energy. You're wasting your time if you do anything else." Um, it was one of the the guys who were from Icon who was with Zyvex who's actually spent enough time with me to, because I mean, here I was uh, a social scientist and, 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 and what ended up happening was there was a startup in the Houston area or in the Dallas area called uh, Zyvex. That's and, right. They, they were looking at atomically, at atomic precision manufacturing right. and then sort of branched out when they and struggled so with that. At, yeah. at, at a conference, he took me under his wing. I should remember his name, but he took me under his wing and we spent uh, a whole day going through his facilities and he, you know, he really introduced me to, to all of the concerns. And this was an incredibly clean shop. I mean, you know, it was a beautiful shop. They, they took everything uh, quite seriously. Uh, but, uh, but that, I mean, you know, and then we, you know, we, then, then Stein took off and, yep. and, 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 and uh, uh, there was incredible amount of, of controversy when it popped up. And, um, uh, I mean, I, first one I want to throw out is the the window dressing component, which I think was the big one, where uh, a lot of folks in the social sciences uh, saw us as window dressing for what engineering and science was just wanted to do. They were just going to bring us on board, and then we were going to, you know, do all this research and say all these wonderful things about them. And unfortunately, they didn't know me very well, obviously. <laughs> I was so, going to say I, I would <laughs> never, I would never accuse you of doing that, David. <laughs> but uh, but that was a, a very a really dominant concern among colleagues. They were very, very interesting. You know, because we used to go to con conferences and they would they would really, you know, I'd be doing a presentation and when the question started, it was like, how legitimate is all this stuff? Are you just you know, are you, or, or are you just you know serving as uh, spokespeople for the federal government in their in their science programs? So, so that's so interesting because I came at this from the other perspective as a, a physicist and a material science person. Um, so I, I got to learn the social science side of things and the importance of, of social and, and stakeholder engagement. So I, I didn't see that pushback in terms of window dressing as much. 
Um, but I did go through the, um, the the experience of talking to the scientists who basically said multiple things, but usually it was, we're doing the same as we've been doing for years. It's just that this is a really convenient branding, calling it nanotechnology. And we're just going to sort of, we're, we're going to sort of navigate through all these weird questions about social stuff. But on the other hand, and I, I we really should say this going back to the early days. Um, it's very easy to be cynical about some of the early emphasis on the, the social, ethical, legal, environmental aspects of nanotechnology. But even with that cynicism, there was something unique that happened there. There was a genuine interest in asking, how do we get this technology right? How do we make sure that we see the benefits of it rather than causing unanticipated harm? Um, and I think that that, that sincere attitude drove an awful lot of, of research and action and in a way that I haven't seen in other emerging areas of technology innovation. And then, of course, we all got cynical right about 2010 again. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's go back. Let's go back late 90s, first couple years of the 2000s. What are the discussions? I mean, what is nano in society then? What were the kinds of questions being asked? Who was asking them? And uh, how are those answers being shared? Mm. Or how are those mostly, conversations yeah, being moderated? And I think Andrew would agree. Mostly the, 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 the subject was turning towards um, human and ecological exposure to nanoparticles. Yep. You know, uh, and, and that's where it, 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 it there were, there were small groups of people in, in uh, social sciences who were spending uh, time talking about uh, issues like equity and um, and uh, bridge poor gap, technological uh, spacing, uh, and all of uh, those issues. But it, the, 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 I think the, the 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 main push at the beginning was, you know, is this is this fundamentally safe? And it did produce a little again. The second level of discord was. Uh, Almost all of the funding that was going to uh, societal interactions um, was was associated with with health, not with these other issues of fairness right, and right. stuff. I mean, the whole subsequent, I guess, webinar we're going to have, this whole outreach engagement webinar is is the the ground that the folks in, in the social sciences saw as their own and occupied as societal interaction research moved down the line. And so they developed that component of it, but initially, it yep. was predominantly. I mean, my first articles were in the, were, were technical articles about uh, nanotoxicology of uh, of nanoparticles found in sunscreens. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. So, right. so there was also a large component of public perception there. So, certainly, a lot of the early concern was driven by what happened with GMOs, um, especially in Europe where people had seen a, a promising technology where the rug had literally been pulled out from underneath it because of a, a public backlash. Um, and it was a very, obviously a very complex public backlash. Um, it wasn't simply due to public ignorance. In fact, I don't think much of it was due to public ignorance at all. It was due to how the introduction of the technology had been managed and how industry had played a role there. But there was a very real concern with nanotechnology that as starting off with the US government. The US government pushed for investment here, US industry pushed for investment, and then that went global, that we would hit a brick wall like we did with GMOs. And so those, a lot of those early conversations were about how do we avoid this? How do we both help people understand what we're actually trying to do? How do we make sure that they've got what uh, certain people thought was the right perception of nanotechnology? How do we listen to their concerns and manage those concerns? Um, and that, in some ways, it was very foresighted, um, I think, because we had the research community asking serious questions about what consumers think, what the public thinks. How do we um, identify when we're going to get a potential backlash and how we're going to manage it? Of course, there were challenges there um, and a lot of misunderstanding, but at least we were asking important questions early on. And that was, I mean, I think, you have to understand it, it, when this was 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 first being you know contemplated among the social scientists, you know we understood what happened with the GMO uh, phenomenon uh, very well because we've been researching it uh, in, um, right. in in communication sciences. I mean, people have been researching that event and the GMO phenomenon that occurred and 
uh, mostly out of Europe was, you know, I mean, there was a point of time where um, peoples in Africa were actually rejecting food assistance under public law 480 because it was associated with uh, genetic engineering of seeds and right. really can be correlated to malnutrition and death. I mean, it was that much of a problem. And we understood like, and, I, and I've been always close to the agricultural part of, of nanoscience, you know, people may not want it in their food, but goddamn, these nano bits are great as sensors and they're a fine way to do precision agriculture right there. And so we, we understood where that difficulty and tension was going to be. Right, you know, right. Something yep. like, like, I mean, I just got off the, I've been working on pandemics, obviously, recently, and uh, I've been getting off the phone going, you know, if you hesitancy, folks, I mean, if, if the guys in the government had just got hold of the, of the social scientists before they started <laughs> approaching this forsaken vaccination program, we would have had a better shot at it. Right, right. We right. have all this data. I, 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 we, we come back to lessons not learned. Yeah. We have all this data, you know, yep. and they just don't pay attention to it. And we got our foot in the door. Yeah, and then, yep. then and you I, had a lot of interesting people come up with a lot of different approaches. Some were successful, and some weren't. So, I just with nanotechnology, I want to jump forward because something really fascinates me here. You go back to the early two thousands, and there was all this angst around public perception, and you had those surveys where people were asked, "Do you know what nanotechnology is? Are you scared of nanotechnology or not?" Multiple surveys. Um, we did an awful lot to try and help people understand what the technology was and where it was going, but also change how the technology developed. But now, if you look at the debate around the social impacts of nanotechnology or the health and safety impacts, there's nothing. Companies are out there doing stuff and nobody's asking any questions. I mean, people are spraying carbon nanotubes onto stuff, and the only commentary you get is, how cool is that? So, and I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. You can argue that it's a really good thing because you can sort of say somehow we diffuse the situation. We've now got a situation where nanotechnology can sort of go full steam ahead and nobody is putting social roadblocks in place. And maybe possibly because we've had the right conversations. Or it might be a bad thing because people have just got tired of the conversations and they've moved on. And I'm not quite sure which way it's falling yet. Well, the other alternative is people never listen to any of the conversations anyways. Right. You mean it was just a bunch of us talking to each other and nobody else talking, was listening? Talking to each other. And the biggest influence we had wasn't on the public, but on each other, which might be good. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Certainly made a few careers. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the public back then just a little bit. So yeah. in 2002, Michael Crichton uh, releases a book called Prey. Yep. in which um, nanobots do unspeakable things <laughs> uh, and uh, life on Earth doesn't end up so good. Um, were you, were both of you, I'm sure, read this soon after it came out, and you probably knew that immediately the rights to create the movie were purchased. Yep, by uh, yep. I, rem I remember back then everybody was sort of waiting. Will they release the movie? When will it release? And what reaction will the public have? And how will that impact nano as a whole? Uh, were either of you cheering for this movie to be made? Were you dreading this movie to be made? Did you <laughs> did you have a box on your wall break break glass if Michael Crichton's movie gets released? So I can I can tell you, and I again there are people on the call that I, I'm sure will have stronger recollections than me. But this was when I was very heavily involved with the National Nanotechnology Initiative, and there was panic. I we were having calls and meetings saying, what are we going to do? Number one, what are we going to do? Because this best-selling book is out there. It's going to turn everybody against um, nanotechnology. And part of that conversation was, well, you know what happened when Jurassic Park came out? It turned people off GMO and genetic modification. What happens if the same happens with nanotech? Of course, the fallacy there was actually Jurassic Park led to an increase in interest in, in biotechnology, but that's, that's an aside story. So there was panic. And then when people heard that Fox had bought the rights, the panic just went through the roof. Um, and it was just incredible, the conversations about how the world was going to end around nanotechnology because people were going to see this movie. Um, I think looking back, we can quite safely say it was an overreaction, but definitely people were highly sensitized to what impact this book might have. I was less concerned, mostly because the book was such a terrible book. But, <laughs> and I, and, but beyond all that was I had worked in production for a long time. And I was working on the West Coast off and on with Paramount. And 
you priced out this movie and it was just never going to be made. It was just too right. expensive to be made. And the reality is, is that there's very little good literature on the significant effect a pop culture artifact like a movie has on yep. a, a science issue. On social issues, it has more of an impact than it does on issues associated with, with, with science. Then on top of it is there were a lot of little things out there about nano, many of which were much more uh, pertinent and much more effective with uh, younger audiences. And uh, actually, uh, Star Trek was the proponent for nano nanomaterials. I mean, they had right. episodes about it, and they were they were always positive in their conclusions, pretty much. You know, and they were actually a, a favorable pop culture artifact uh, and resource for us to use um, in, um, in 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 our discussions on societal implications. Yeah, and of course, I now I actually teach um, using science fiction movies about science and society, I can say with quite a high level of confidence that just because you see a technology in a movie doesn't really change your perception on that technology unless there are other things that come into play at the same time, unless it's part of a, a larger dialogue within society. Yeah, there's the affirming effect too, is, is that you go out to see the movies which are consistent with how you already feel about the science or technology. That's right. So I, if you, what, what, just, you go to the, the terror movies, and if you really like it, you go to the movies where they, it's it's one of the characters that solves all the world's problems. Right, right, right. It's okay, and you've got that social connection. Uh, so one of the movies I, I teach from is um, Jurassic Park. I, this is a slight aside to nanotechnology, but we use that as a platform for talking about everything from genetic manipulation to power structures, to what happens when very wealthy people get to say what science is done, a lot of social issues. And yet, when I saw Jurassic Park when it first came out, when I was in my, what, late 20s, I'm losing track of how old I am, all I thought was, this is a cool movie. I yeah. was not touched in any way whatsoever about the, the science. And it's I think it's ironic that even though I now use the movie to teach about science in society, when I first saw the movie, it had zero impact on me in terms of raising my awareness about social issues or even the technology. It was just a good movie. All right, so there's, there's sort of two events that do hit the public at least a little bit in sort of 2006, 2007. And that is Magic Nano and Benny the Bear. And I'm curious <laughs> if either of you would like to uh, sort of explain I, to our listeners what happened in either of those two. I'm good with Magic Nano. You want to do Benny the Bear? I can do Benny the Bear, and I've, I've got a little bit of Magic Nano as well, but I'll let you take the lead there. Yeah. So, um, Jamie. You want to start? Yeah. Okay, who starts? I, I, can, I can start with Benny the Bear. And yeah, I, start with that, that's, that's probably chronologically correct. So, Jamie, I don't know whether you came across Benny before we did, but my first exposure to Benny was when we were putting together the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars inventory on consumer products containing nanotechnology. And this was the, the database where we were searching for anything where the manufacturers claimed it had nano in in some form or another. And we came across this range of plush toys where um, I'm pretty sure first time around they were using nano silver to give them antimicrobial properties in the um, the, the, the plush finish of them. Um, and so we, we put them in the inventory and that led to a whole discussion sort of both with us and the company and, and in society more generally about whether this was a good idea, whether we really should be giving kids toys where they can suck on them and be ingesting nano silver. Um, and, and there was there was such a fuss around this that the company actually ended up not making the, the toy or initially taking the nano silver out. But I, Jamie, you ought to dip in here because you ran with the nano, the, the Benny the Bear story. I, I found that if I took a stuffed bear into a talk about nano in society, all of a sudden people were significantly more interested. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. I. Uh, I think it did lead to at least a fair amount of discussion long after the bear was no longer being sold in stores. And I think you have to admit to the audience that you still have at least one copy of Benny the Bear in your offices. I have I have two copies of Benny the Bear, and I have a grad I know a, grad, a former grad student who has a one armed Benny the Bear because he was a um, environmental engineer, and he removed one arm, reduced it to its bear components to determine, in fact, there was nano silver inside that bear. And there was nano silver. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I believe it was in the I would believe it was in the foam stuffing, not in the outer shell. Actually, yeah, that 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 makes sense. 
But yeah. so the, there's there's a side story to this, which is actually a little bit more sobering. So we put that database together, and there are huge cons as well as pros with the, the database. I, I, looking back, I think it served a purpose, but there are also some challenges with it. But we found that by far and away, the most prevalent um, products on the market using nanotechnology were products using nanoscale silver as an antimicrobial agent um, for a number of reasons. One is they were easy to find. Another one was that that just happened to be the technology du jour that a lot of companies thought they could very easily tack onto their products. But because of that, there was a sudden flurry of interest in the potential health and environmental impacts of nanosilver to the stage where there are very large grants that have been given out to study this. There have been people that have made their academic careers on studying nanosilver. And the sobering part of this is there is virtually no evidence that nanosilver is any more harmful than just metallic silver, which actually is quite harmful. But because people got locked into this narrative that there's something unique about nanosilver, it's almost impossible to pull them back from that. Because if you've made your career as a tenured professor saying nanosilver is harmful, if you come out and say, I was wrong, where do you go next? And, and that's actually a very real concern with how we start these narratives, and we have mm -hmm. no way of pulling back from them. Benny the Bear started it all, so actually Benny the Bear is to blame, not us. Well, when did Benny, well, in 2005, we have uh, this company called Kleinman, and uh, it's part of a group of Illinois Tool Works. They market a product called Magic Nano, um, and there are about 4,000 cans of this um, um, material. They were actually marketed. They were sold at penny market discount stores at the end of March. 27th and 28th in 2005, and out of the sales, 97 people reported breathing problems and heavy coughing and trouble sleeping. Six were hospitalized. The complaints were mostly reported by phone calls. Um, and the German Federal Institute for Risk Analysis re released the statement warning consumers uh, that they might want to take consideration before they use this product. The consideration was don't use it in enclosed spaces. But considering it's a bathroom, clean it, it sort of reduced the probability that wasn't going to happen. Outside and, showers, David. That's obviously what it was for. And it was it is exactly what it was for. Uh, the uh, climate products involved were glass and ceramic protective sealants. They were both sold as Magic Nano. Um, uh, the product line itself uh, turned out to uh, be a bit of a misunderstanding. Uh, the product line uh, had a, a suspension that was uh, sold by a group called Nanopool, and it was a liquid in question, that, but it didn't contain any nanoparticles in it. Uh, there were all these hearings done by BFR, which was the uh, German uh, risk analysis group. Um, they studied the material from uh, Nanopool. They studied all the climate material. They looked at Hago uh, Chemotechnic, which was the source of the aerosol itself that was in the cans. And it would um, generally it was uh, uh, it was just used as a sanitizer, and people were told to use a lot of ventilation, and they didn't. And when they didn't use a lot of ventilation, they were just breathing in a cleaner, right? It didn't right. matter if it was nanoparticles or not. Right. And so I did a well, I have one article on this in print actually in in, in a journal that came back when. Um, and if anybody wants it, I can I can. I can put it on some page for people to read it in great detail, but it covers the entire history of, of Magic Nano, how, how much of a farce it all was. So do you, do you remember where you first heard about Magic Nano? Magic of Nano. I think oh, the, 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 the product. So the, the, there is a, an addition to this story. Um, and again, it goes back to my days at the, the Wilson Center, where we were not only working on um, exposure to nanoscale materials and products um, in society, but, but conversations around them. And uh, my colleague, Dave Rajeski, who I was working with at the time, I, he's got German roots. Um, and he had a colleague, he was either a family member or a colleague in Germany who sent him a German article about Magic Nano. And he read it and he thought, this is important. So he then spoke to uh, Washington Post reporter, Rick Weiss, who yep. wrote it up. And I think if my memory serves me correctly, it appeared either just above or below the, the fold on the front page of the Washington Post. And that's when everything went crazy. 
so you've you've got this really sort of interesting sort of connection where this could have just died. I mean, in the the media, nobody yeah. would have known about it, and apart from those sort of those, those weird connections. And then the irony that it was neither magic nor nano at the end of the. And actually, I just went and looked at the article, and David referenced in it. I used to actually reference you as well. Uh, that you know, as the quote was, that your quote was, first impressions matter." <laughs> <laughs> but but did I say about, what those first impressions were? I mean, when you when you're looking at Magic Nano and we were talking about whether this was bad or not, your observation was these first impressions matter. And yeah. then you added this: this is a great danger. You're going to have to respond, have a response against nanotech as a whole. <laughs> so um, I should send you this article since you're referenced <laughs> it. Yes. So, so we got these two instances. Did we learn anything from this? Did, 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 was there a pivot in the way either of you worked or government worked or researchers or companies worked? Well, I mean, I, the first one is a, a lot of nano wasn't nano. Yep. Um, I, mean, uh, I mean, I don't think many people disagree. The one thing about nanoparticles is trying to keep them from, you know, aggregating. They just, they, you know, they like to bunch up together. Um, remember all that literature that, that was coming out on sunscreens and ooh, bad because oh, yeah. nanoparticles went there. Well, the more I studied in, and I wrote this in the Journal of Nanoparticle Research that, you know, when I looked at companies like BASF and all and checked their research in, in, in the lab, these nanoparticles were great, you know, at, you know, reflecting UV light and, 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 and it did a great job. But what happened is as soon as they put it into a formula which then could be applied to the body and aggregated into microparticles. Right. So all the right. advantages of having it as a nanoparticle never existed. Right. And, and so people really weren't, weren't they weren't even exposed to nanoparticles. So, right? so I, I think that this was part of the challenge. And I, I think looking back, hopefully we've learned a lot. And I, I would say certainly personally, I've learned a lot in terms of what maybe we shouldn't do or how we need to be more nuanced. But one of the, the huge challenges I, I think we face, and this actually comes back to Benny the Bear and, and Magic Nano, is having a, a, a reasoned and an open conversation about what's important. Um, and I say that because if we were to do that without any particular stake in the game, we would have realized early on that there are some things around nanotechnology and nanomaterials which are really serious, really important when it comes to societal impact. And there are some things that really aren't that important and some things where we're just making stuff up. Um, but because we weren't able to have those reasoned um, conversations, we tended to lump everything in together. And there was, wasn't quite scaremongering, but there was a, a lot of a, a lot of speculation about how bad things could be that obfuscated the science. Um, and looking back, I really wish we could have asked the right questions rather than being dominated and, and obsessed with the, the wrong questions. So, I, and that comes back to both Magic Nano and um, Benny the Bear. One thing we discovered after those and a number of other things was manufacturers that previously were quite proud to say that they had Nano in their product began to pull back from that. Uh, they still used um, the same sort of technologies because they worked for them, but they were very careful in terms of what they said about that technology and what they called it. Um, and I'm not sure that that was a good thing because it made it harder to understand what people were doing. Um, on the other hand, all the hype around what I would consider to be the wrong questions um, led to all of this speculative discussion in society and, and discussion which made people concerned without warrant. Um, and I'm not sure that that was a good thing. And I, I just I, before I give David a, a chance um, to, to speak here, one of the things that really has struck me over the last several years thinking about this is we talk a lot about responsible innovation. And usually when we talk about responsible innovation, we talk about the scientists, engineers, technologists developing stuff. But that same responsibility applies to the social scientists and others in terms of what the questions are that they ask, how they address them, and the narratives they form around them. And I don't think we think enough about that. And my, uh, my spin on all of this is most of the early work that was being done um, by serious social scientists, uh, and there weren't a lot of us, uh, was debunking a lot of the claims made by uh, the folks who are more excited about uh, getting a lot of, of press for themselves or getting uh, support for uh, their organizations, which were heavily dependent on donations and memberships. 
So we had a lot of these. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know who you're talking about there. I mean, actually, no, 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 no. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, well, there were some faux, I mean, there were some faux NGOs out there, right? right? And I mean, they were just generating garbage after garbage in their public. And they would say absolutely anything. It's just like the fake news we're dealing with today. And, you know, you would take, and I did this in one of the articles I wrote, you would take a page of what they said. And if you went down every one of the single citations, you would find out that the citations were taken out of context or they didn't, you know, re relate to exactly how uh, this, this application was taking place or what this product was. The other group, which was infuriating, at least to me, were all of the folks who decided they didn't like technology, period and decided that that was a reason you shouldn't like nano, which of course is a logical problem on a, a, a massive scale. And I went to NYU, so I had to deal with Neil Postman before he passed, right? And Neil Postman was teaching in, in the College of Education where you could take elective courses. Neil and I never got along. And the reason Neil and I never got along is because of his absolutist claims that technology was gonna just destroy the planet. It may but it also may save the planet. And this, I think, was the big problem we had with SEI. There were a lot of folks who got involved with it who said, you know, technology is bad. It doesn't help all the social classes. You're going, yes, that is true. That is very, very true. That is an argument for the redistribution of wealth. That is not an argument to de-technologize society and go back to uh, uh, a tribalism. Right. I mean, there has to be better ways of doing this. And I think all of that tension took place. So you never got in SEIN what you really expected might go there. Yep. And you sure the hell didn't want to chase out the folks who were doing the serious research in health, human health and ecosystem health, because they were actually producing data, a lot of data that gave us something to study. And it was always this incredible tension, even in the social science group about what was relevant and what was not relevant. You know, like we're dealing with infrastructure networks right now, and I think there's big societal issues here, but I think the societal issues need to be specific to an infrastructure network, not just to nanoscience, right? We're talking about characterization and we're talking about fabrication. That's, this is a different thing. So I, and the way we critique that is different from the way we critique technology at all. I, I, I was going to say, I, I, I think I had a slightly different takeaway from those interactions, but I think one of the things that really stands out from what we experienced is um, the importance of agendas within different groups. So um, nanotechnology was anything but agendaless. Every single group, whether it was researchers, government agencies, businesses, civil society, they had an agenda where they were trying to co-op nanotechnology to reach certain ends. Um, and I think the point at which I realized that was the point that I began to understand how you could actually work at the nexus between those different groups, understanding what their motivations were. But at the same time, incredibly frustrating if you're trying to do something that you think is important and you're working with groups that are trying to co-opt what is happening for a different set of reasons. Um, what I would say though, it's especially with civil society, um, those early years of nanotechnology were when I learned to work with and respect civil society groups, despite all their frustrations. So I think I would agree with you on every point you made about these groups. And yet I would say that you can also look at what they're doing through a different lens, where they have a different set of social objectives and they're looking at the levers they can pull and the buttons they can push to achieve those objectives. Um, and I had very, very productive relationships and, and conversations indeed with a lot of these groups, at the same time, constantly being very frustrated with how they messaged and, and what they did. But I still have really good relationships with a lot of those people. All right, we have a question from the audience from David Moak at Montana State, wondering if nanoethics should be considered a new and emerging field of scholarship an extension or an extension of other types of scholarship and whether there's any unique nano aspects of ethics that we should be thinking about. David. That's 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 a mouthful there. Uh, I'm not sure uh, unless they could come up with some specific uh, uh, area of ethics. I mean, like I've written papers on communal ethics. I've written papers on on on. Uh, 
astrohistory. I've written papers on many different fields. But I mean, it depends what you're talking about here, right? I mean, is there something ethically unique about nanotechnology per se? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. It's it, it's it's a, it's a platform technology that allows us to make a lot of things uh, a little bit more efficient and and better. That's yep. primarily what it what it's done, and it's so, contributed to a lot of different areas. But I think Andy is right about the, the you know everyone comes to this. They're stakeholders, right? They all yep. have their own stakes. They come to it with their own idea of what is is good, and you've got to be able to uh, work your way through it and engage in. And, and debate and argument. And and like, you know, I think no one is free. No one gets to say whatever they want to say without being subjected to, uh, you know, being uh, debunked and rebutted uh, and that they have to deal with it. But I'm not sure I've ever come across a singular thing specific to nanoscience per se that is ethically unique from other forms of technology. I think that'd be really hard to define. I, I, I would agree with, with a bit of a nuance there. So I I grapple a lot with this, um, but very specifically in the area of artificial intelligence ethics, which is the big thing at the moment. And I argue very strongly that it's an inappropriate focus because when you're talking about ethics, you're talking about um, what is right and wrong within different contexts. Um, and it is very hard to make that technology specific. Even harder when you look at nano, where um, I've argued for years now that that um, working at the nanoscale or nanotechnology is a useful way of branding a certain approach to things and a certain way of doing things. But there is nothing unique about nano. It's not as if everything suddenly changes when you get below 100 nanometers. We know that from um, health impacts and environmental impacts. Um, and certainly, if it doesn't apply to um, health and environment, it's not going to apply to ethics. So I think if you're not careful, if you try and make something around nanoethics, you close off a lot of avenues of investigation and a lot of conversations. The one caveat here is, um, if you look at technology innovation more broadly, I think we are beginning to do stuff which does raise very serious ethical issues, which touches on nanotechnology. And that's the ability to fundamentally manipulate the world around us at the atomic scale. So whether you're looking at um, biotechnology and manipulating um, DNA, whether you're looking at uh, materials and manipulating them at the atomic scale so you can create materials with very unique characteristics, or when you're combinating um, bio and materials with cyber capabilities and AI capabilities, which allow you to fundamentally change the reality we're living in. That's when a unique class of ethical questions arise. It's not nano specific, but it is technological capability specific. Yeah, Jamie, I, I often argue it's it's what happens when you have true convergence, right? When you have all these sciences coming together, you know, and they empower each other and they empower yep. each other at a level far greater than anyone singularly. I would agree. That's where you have the problem. I once had a really good interdisciplinary conversation with some nanoscientists and engineers because they asked me why I studied nano. And I said, well, why do you call yourself a nanoscientist and engineer? And they said, we don't. We're chemists. We're physicists. And where does the nano come from? And they said, well, that's where the money is. That's how, who funds us. They want us to call it that. And I turned to them. I said, exactly. And then all of a sudden they realized, oh, my God, you have the same approach we did. And we were able to get along quite well after that. Yes. <laughs> All right, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask the big question. Uh, did either of you make predictions back in the early days about the future of nano and society, and did they or did they not come true? I think I steered clear of quite a lot of predictions. Um, I did warn that if we don't take um, the potential consequences of what we're doing seriously, um, we will either have adverse consequences show themselves or it will be very hard for businesses to develop products which people accept. I'm not entirely sure that we've seen either of those come to fruition. Um, I see companies now that are going health for leather and using nanoscale materials without much thought as to potential social impacts. And I actually don't see many social impacts either, to be honest. So yeah, I wasn't the, the predictions that I didn't make, I don't think were very good. Yeah, I'm I'm in pretty much the same boat. I try not to make predictions. Um, you know, I'm 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 
I think that of, of all of, of the things that I can, uh, that, that can conclude about um, the societal uh, impacts of, of nanotechnology uh, is what I was telling most of my colleagues all, the, all, the way, all through this, that I'm a social scientist. I'll try to gather as much data as I can to make, you know, arguments that are, that are, that are, that are made from um, uh, numbers rather than, and, than um, uh, anecdotes. And I will do my best, you know, to to make sense out of things. But, you know, it's my primary concerns at the beginning was this stuff might be really dangerous, right? And it and it, it might it might impact human health and welfare, and it might have a significant impact on the ecosystem. And that's where a lot of the focus needed to be, and that's where a lot of the focus then went. And then, as I think you'll cover in your next uh, your next presentation. Um, the other world appeared, which was the world of outreach, engagement, and education, which was a whole different yep. buckle, uh, 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 a bucket of worms. And um, it, it was a wonderful place for a lot of folks who had great concerns about technology to find footing and to really, you know, make a significant contribution to uh, what we were doing in nanoscience. All right, I'm going to sneak one more question in before David Gottfried kicks us out of the room. Um, are there any questions or issues that were being discussed in the early days that we've sort of forgotten about or lost track of that we really need to revisit, that we really need to say, hey, wait a second, we talked about that once, but we never really figured that out. Let's, let's begin that conversation again. I think in the so, early days, I, in the early days, we were having fairly sophisticated conversations about what it might be about engineering stuff at the nanoscale, which raised unique social concerns. Um, and that got lost really quickly. It actually got lost um, very quickly when regulators got involved because they needed something simple and quantitative to measure. They weren't really interested in nuance. Um, and I would, and as a result, I think we've lost conversations that are more broad about unique consequences of how we're doing stuff in, in science and technology. So I would love to be able to get back to some of those conversations. Yeah, I'm pretty much in, in this, on this, in, you know, I'm, we're, we feel almost exactly alike there. It, science and technology is, 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 is fascinating. I was probably a physicist in my previous life. Um, but you know the thing that 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 bring that 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 fascinates me about uh, about this whole field is I I look at the world around me and I look at all the inequalities and I look at all the problems we're confronting and I go you know there has to be a way out of this and I think the way out of this is some combination of treating people better and finding ways to take the world we are living in and and we're perpetuating and making it um, work to the uh, the benefit of everyone. And I think that's 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 where we have to be. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it, it's 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 a hard play, you know. And uh, you know, uh, COVID notwithstanding, it's just a it's a hard play. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. When I had my uh, thoughts of who would be the dream team for this panel, that you two names came right up, and I'm so glad you were able to join us for this. Um, I don't know. If, David Gottfried, if you have any final words, a reminder of when the August will, uh, um, seminar will be. But in the meantime, I'm going to clap from where I am. And thank you both for sharing your well, 20 years you. of knowledge. It's been a pleasure. Maybe 30 years or 40 years of knowledge. I just want to jump in and thank both Andrew and David and, of course, Jamie for moderating and setting up this session. And thank all of our attendees for joining us. Um, as Jamie said, just a reminder, our next um, webinar will be on Wednesday, August 25th, also at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And you can find the information on the NNCI website, www.nnci.net slash events. Uh, we'll see you then. Take care, everybody. Take care, guys. Be safe, everyone.